It's either that or you can come into my, my apartment and play bar mitzvah. Speaking of which, the, uh, you know, the CD's really great. I was actually trying to deconstruct. That they're responsible for such hits as uh, Reeling in the Years, Ricky Don't Lose That Number, and uh, Hey 19. And they're out now with a new album called Two Against Nature, which uh, took them about uh, 19 years or 20 years or so to make. What is up with that? Why did it take you so long? Well, uh, we didn't do much the first uh, 17 and a half years. We were just thinking about it. First time I heard Sealy Dan, uh, grew up in Northern California, driving along the coast with my parents. Just hanging out uh, in their pickup truck, driving through the woods uh, in rural Massachusetts, and uh, they popped in a tape. I was in the back seat of my mom's car, we were going to school, and it, uh, the first time I heard was with the First Lily Dan Smith, I was 15, I was rummaging through some of my mom's old tapes and uh, happened upon Asia. I was a fan since then. And a the bikini by the pool listening to Hey 19 when I was 16. And I didn't get it. <laughs> Feels like I've always been listening to Steely Dan. Oh, I was listening to it when I was living on my friend's brown sexual sofa. Which friend? Tina Holt. I was a little kid, uh, I heard, uh, I think it was the year of the cat, on oh, my, uh, I hit my father. Actually, that's Stewart. No. It is. Yeah. <laughs> when we first heard Steely Down, we were 17, we went to a concert in Shoreline after the year. So you heard them live then? Yeah. yeah. What do you remember? I remember, you tell them. <laughs> the whole audience is going like this. It was great. <laughs>
green earring I remember Rings of red design I remember Look in your eyes I don't mind I don't mind I don't mind Thank you very much. Green earrings, thank you. Appreciate it. Two Against Nature, is it in any way a departure from your other works, or is there, is there something new that fans of yours might be surprised by? The secret messages are in there, it buried is. in the lyrics. Walker plays most of the guitar solos. I guess I was nine years old or ten years old, and I got, I was given my grandmother's radio and then uh, got to listen to, you know, tune in to rock and roll stations, which included all kinds of weird New Orleans stuff and doo wop stuff and uh, jazz. It was so exciting. Yeah, it was so incredibly exciting, and it also had a sound to it, you know, an incredible, you know, ambiance that, you know, obviously were parts of whole styles and musical traditions uh, that I knew nothing about, full of emotion. Sex sex and emotion and you know weird teenage lore cousin dupree is uh, kind of a traditional kind traditional of traditional fun country sort of tune and uh uh yeah we have a little story in there you know that's uh you know maybe a little as my father would say risque <laughs> Everything I know Teach me how to do that 
dance Life is short and could blow, blow And what's so strange about a down old family much cousin Dupree little uh, rural narrative why do you think relatively few artists introduce humor to their songs no sense of humor <laughs> <laughs> did you when you came together for this album did you bring your, your wealth of knowledge from your previous work or do you feel that you had evolved as musicians and you wanted to try something new completely new um, did we learn anything from a I mean, I, other stuff. I, I think we probably did, but we forgot a lot of yeah. it as we were going along. So which of the previous albums do you regard with um, personal most satisfaction and why? I think Kind of Blue was my favorite. Okay. This is something, an idea, the long-cherished idea of Donald and mine, that we would have our own public access TV okay. show. Good. And then I'll just kick somebody right. in. And then uh, they're going to bring in some kind of... Oh you want to tell the band really that we're not going to be playing anymore today? No, we are. We're going to do this really quick. Hi, we're back again, and this is this is my friend Donald Fagan. And this is uh, Walter Becker, and we're here with uh, uh, one of the uh, musicians in our band. Uh, this year, which camera should I be looking in? Miss Vicky Cave. Glad to have you with us, Vicky. It's good to be here. Now, tell me, how did you get in a situation like this? <laughs> in a situation like this? You asked me to come in the room. Uh, well, I, I meant more generally speaking. You know, generally like what were you doing right before you were in our band? Right before I was in your band, I was, and still I'm doing, uh, cabaret. 
Cabaret. I actually knew that, but for the sake of the show, I wanted to just ask the question. Yeah. All right, get out of here, okay? Right. And uh, Thanks, send guys. someone else in, okay? Yeah, really. Send Carolyn in, actually. I love because Carolyn in. She'd be far more interesting than that. Okay. stand to hear, including yours and mine and one of our chimp who isn't here. I can see the ladies talking, how the times are getting hot, and that fierce come excavation on Magnolia Boulevard. Yes, I'm going insane. Just a minute. Thank you, a bad sneaker. That's a real New York sort of number. Kind of a local deal. It was one of those things that uh, I guess what we can classify as adult contemporary radio right now and smooth jazz. It's, it's funky, it's jazzy, it's mellow, it's, it's got a lot of heart, you know? And it's got a great sense of humor. You could say it's blue eyed soul, you could say it's jazz, you could say it's one of the blues. It's a, it's a lot of things. It's really the, the, the Fagan, Fagan riffs and uh, old Michael McDonald voice. A lot of nice chunky horns, smooth horns. That was good stuff. I guess the voicey falsettos, man, you know? It still rocks, you know what I mean? It still rocks and fucks at the same time. But I'm Ryan Steely Dan right up there with Madonna and Bach. It's some of my favorite music. Uh, ironically, I just came back from a film festival out in the mountains. I rented a car, of course, there's no CD player. So I stopped in the gas station, and what do I pick up? Steely Dan's greatest hits. It's just kind of like that chill out music that just gives you the kind of 
It's kind of that laid back mood. That's like, it's always been a, it's been kind of timeless. It's fun, it's quite fun. And uh, it just sticks. Did they, did they play Woodstock 94? No. No, they didn't.
Thanks very much, Josie. Thank you. Thanks very much. But is the relationship between you and your instrument one just because it's an ex like say you have an exp an expensive bass and a much less expensive? Do you feel like more intimate with the more expensive one? Well, you, you should, but there's no you know if you, you you know if you can have like a plywood right. bass and it sounds great, yeah. but uh, hopefully the more expensive instrument would be the better right. one. Right. So you would, but you could call it the relations of production really. In a certain well, sense. let's look at it this way. Suppose the bass was a hooker, right? Exactly. Let's say you got a thousand dollar a night hooker right. versus a hundred dollar a night hooker, right? right. The hundred dollar a night hooker has what? A heart of gold, right? So That's which true. one? Do, which one? You know? Which one do you take home to mother? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of mother, let's look at it from yeah. a Freudian uh -huh. angle for a second. Like it's funny that Tom made that jump right there to mother. Yeah, from the hooker. Yeah, That's yeah, why mother. I was I was okay. aware of that too, but. But um, if you look at the, the instruments as like, especially like people have, guitar players have, you know, 20, 25, 30, 75 instruments. Uh, uh, are these, you know, transitional objects, that is to say fetishes, which goes back to some, something having to do with inadequate mothering or something like that? Uh, can you repeat that? No. 
Okay. I, 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 you lost I mean, me. in sort of the Winnicott sense of a transition. Yeah, let's look at it in object, object relations. Object uh, relations sense. He's coming definitely. from an object relations perspective you know on this. In other words, rather than say, you, you know, know, when you're young and, you know, like some kids will have their blankie or their yeah, yeah. teddy bear or, I mean, it's possible that, that uh, you know, you're, you're an adult, but you still have these things that you're attached to in a certain way, which, which make you feel a certain way. You know yeah, what I'm saying? The need for the binky. Yeah, binky, yeah. right. That's binky. the perfect the example, right? right. For the binky. So is that, you know, is that nice, you know, yeah. ESP base with the quilted maple uh, yes, top sir. there, is that a binky? That's is that the binky question? Binky number one. Binky number one. That's correct. Cool. Yeah. Some somewhere between a nerd and a and a uh, Schmendrick. Schmendrick, you know, I was sort of the, didn't fit in on any level, sort of really. Also, I liked jazz when I was pretty young. My father had uh, bought a hi-fi sometime around 1958 or 59, and he had like three or four records, and one of them happened to be a uh, Dave Brubeck record, and there was just these long, you know, beautiful Paul Desmond solos on this thing. That's how I started listening to. Uh, 
to jazz. I mean, the two of them, it just that they are such jazz buffs. It's ridiculous. And the irony is, is that a lot of guys who are hardcore jazz musicians sometimes dream of being like heavy rock and rollers. And in this way, these guys who are uh, whatever, rock, pop, soul, they dream of being in a dingy basement playing an upright piano and like, you know, West Montgomery kind of guitar. So they just put together everything that they love. Grooves, incredible. Both of them were literature majors or something, so they love sort of storytelling and uh, sort of jazz-influenced harmonies. It seems to me that they're doing is basically just writing from their heart and what they actually feel. Because it covers, as far as I'm concerned, so many different areas. You know, there's a bit of R&B, there's a bit of uh, jazz in terms of a lot of the chord progressions and the way they kind of glue them together. But then they'll turn around and do a blues. They, they have an amazing chemistry, so you can't, you can't always expect to take them a certain way and just because they'll never do what you expect them to do. <laughs> Donald reminds me of my dad. Um, I, I find them both easy to be around, uh, but I get that Donald's sh shy and, like mm -hmm. my father, very witty and very uh, at home in his work, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, very uh, just made of music. Through and through, both of them.
this mighty spike lock, check out the work itself. A mix of elegance and function. That's right, a tweak or two, and then she's out of here. The songs are more stories, yeah. you know, stories. than they've been. Not that they haven't been before, but I think mm -hmm. like a lot of the older lyrics are about like sex and drugs. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Oh no, they are. But you could talk to ten different people, and you know, there's like ten, 10 different, different inter interpretations. Yeah, interpretations of what the song is about. So I figured that that maybe there's codes in the songs. It's the only one you've got. You might use it if you feel better when you get home. I always wondered, what does that mean? What are they talking about? For me. When I hear the lyrics, I don't usually laugh. Sometimes there's like a small weeping. And somebody said that they were aliens that were, uh, uh, or they were beamed up by aliens. That's why they have such good music and stuff like that. You know, it's it's very possible. It's elusiveness. See, I always thought being like a backup singer, if, you know, we all did this full time. Mm -hmm. We definitely have to be in the CIA because this is the best cover you could ever dream of. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know? exactly. And there's just so much downtime on the road. I'm not smart enough. We're all
Friday. Cornelius was talking about the fact that he plays in the subway regularly uh, to get a certain feeling. So you think that's valuable? Yes, Cornelius has got some weird thing with the subways. We have. Gentlemen. Okay. What about us? Aren't you going to say hello to us? Well, I, I just meant in a general way, you know. Cornelius Bumpus. Are we rolling? Always rolling. Always rolling. Now, there seems to be, you know, a sort of a, uh, I, I don't know how to say it, a kind of a, uh, a uh, how would you describe it, between Cornelius and, and, and some of the other band members, and maybe even between Cornelius and us, a kind of, I don't know, tension, or not, not a, maybe not a real tension, a sort of a faux tension. It's really. sort of a gruff repartee, I would describe it. You right. Know? It's kind it, of, com sort, yeah, it's kind of like a camaraderie. I think we have to go back to, uh, we have to go back in time yeah. to, uh, if we're really going to shed any light on this. What was your first, uh, Cornelius, what was your first professional engagement as a musician? This is from the tension thing, down to back to the first gig. Yeah. Well, yeah. We're, we're gonna be jumping around in okay. time. Don't let okay. that bother you. I got you. Okay. It's just like a film. They can do that. You, you see, know? modern, okay. modern um, you know, know psychoanalytic you... theory um, posits the notion that uh, many of the uh, keys to present-day uh, situations are are to be discovered in the past. My in first a, uh, gig. Exhaustive analysis of the uh, events. And that, and Perhaps that the, even going back as far as childhood. And that the, the we don't have time to do here now. And that the unconscious always says yes. So. Rem be aware of that while you're, while you're, uh, you know, digging, digging. Can I go now? If I get now, now.
It's everything they say The end of a perfect day Just the lights from across the bay
very much. I'm going to take a minute here to introduce the, uh, thank you, the entire band uh, to my immediate right. A uh, new member of our band this year, a wonderful guitar player, as you've already discovered, from New York City. Please welcome John Harrington. Behind uh, John on the uh, horn riser tonight, a wonderful musician, wonderful guy, and a veteran of many of our bands and many other famous bands of the 70s. Please welcome Cornelius Bumpus. Uh, next to Cornelius, um, a player that solos uh, are featured on uh, our new record, uh, Two Against Nature. Please welcome Chris Potter. Uh, playing the trumpet tonight. Uh, great musician, great trumpet player, great arranger. Please welcome Michael Lenhart. <laughs> and the trombone, another wonderful player who's uh, all over our uh, new record and uh, going to be touring with us this summer. Please welcome Jim Pugh. <laughs> Moving over into the uh, rhythm section, uh, our uh, drummer featured on that last uh, number and indeed throughout the evening. Very happy to be playing tonight with Mr. Ricky Lawson. Another veteran of all of our touring bands of the 90s and uh, on into the new millennium on the bass guitar. Please welcome Tom Barney. Currently seated at the uh, Fender Rhodes Piano, uh, a new member of our touring ensemble and also our recording uh, uh, group. Uh, please welcome Ted Baker. <laughs> Moving over into the uh, female vocalist section, please welcome Ms. Victoria Cave. <laughs> Next to uh, Victoria, a fine vocalist who's uh, been on recordings with us and also toured with us in 1996. Please welcome Carolyn Lenhart. And also featured on our new recording and touring with us for the first time, uh, Miss Cynthia Calhoun. Uh, as far as two against nature, I think the whole concept of it. This is my, my oh yeah, she's my take on it. For this too. No, but I think it's just it's all about like different people with with alternative lifestyles. It's like you know, like cousin Dupree. It's like. That's not in the norm. That's not every every day, but it's you know, it's just it's not I'm saying these are not like their experiences, but I'm sure they read and they know and they all all of this stuff and and if they're true stories, you know, like shame is like it's like my life story. But uh, you know <laughs> but <laughs> But that's just my take on it. Okay. Unlike a lot of artists that are out there, you know, Donald and Walter have a really good idea of what it is that they want. And you'd be surprised at the artists that are out there that really don't have a clue. These guys know what they want. They understand what a groove is about, <laughs> you know, placement of a beat. I mean, they just, they, you know, they're very complete musicians and, and, and artists in general. And that's a rare thing. Well, and it's probably the most musical gig I've ever done. Those guys are like a uh, hand in glove truly uh, complement one, one another's personalities. Donald and Walter are the type of cats that uh, they want you to bring what it is that you do to the table as well, to enhance whatever the songs are and what the music is about. And that, you know, that I really enjoy about them. The way we actually ended up playing it was more, it wasn't really doing the ba da 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 you know, it's more just hanging on the chords, right? You can try, you know, kind of a break, Ricky, or whatever you want there. You know, just whatever feels good. So that sort of, that sort of took the place of the actual intro. And as soon as everyone gets it, come in, and that, that's that you're in the intro already, you know? I mean, one of, one of the real special things about it is there's such density in the writing and you know extremely intricate harmonies and stuff and it's like really really interesting from a horn player's viewpoint i'm just i'm just kidding i'm just kidding you the man you the man and then then this is halfway through the bridge is where i am now the process of working in the studio with them is uh it, it's very experimental in a way it's it's very free 
The process was was really relaxed, and I was free to fool around with things if I wanted to. And it was it was fun. It was pure fun. And then an A major nine. See what I'm saying? I was going using the pattern, you know. And then you got a C sharp. Sharp nine and then flat nine. While the music played, you walked by candlelight. Those San Francisco nights, you were the best in town. Just by chance, you crossed the diamond with the pearl. You turned it on the world. It's when you turn the world around. Did you realize you were a champion? Stuff was laced with kerosene, but yours was kitchen clean. Everyone stopped to stare at your Technicolor motorhome. Every A-frame had your number on the wall. You must have had it all. Go to LA on a dare and you go it alone. Could you see the day? You feel your whole world fall apart. Friends are dead. This life can be very strange. All those day glow freaks who used to paint the face, they join the human race. Some things will never change. The test tubes and the scale Just get it all out of here Is the gas in the car? Is this gas in the car? Think the people down the hall Know who you are Careful what you carry Cause the man is wise You are still an outlaw
much. Uh, Good show. Question point five that uh, Ricky spotted one here. What is the Steely Dan policy about intraband dating? As opposed to contraband dating. Yeah, or uh, extra <laughs> band dating. Extra band dating is out. And um, intra. Well, didn't we have a? Dating. Uh, We're not dating any yeah. extra bands. <clears throat> we had it. We had a little memo about that on the website. I yes, believe, you did. Uh, I've seen it. <laughs> in '96. Um, yeah, it's under the. I think we called it the New Chivalry. And. Uh, <laughs> It was essentially a, uh, a attempt to uh, reinvigorate the uh, put some romance back in the uh, in the touring process for us mostly. <laughs> there were there were some uh, you know you... there were some some, you know, some some disciplinary me measures in case some of the other band members you know over you know just crossed the line you know. We didn't want anyone making band. eye contact with no you eye know. contact right, with no the background band. singers that kind background of thing. Singers and, you know, uh, stuff like that. I, mean, I don't think they were like to speak to them either. Well, certainly not.
Let me yeah. just say, Pete. Pete is, is not. Uh, we've had musicians in our band so far. Pete is not actually a musician in our band, but he has a very special relationship to to, to the band. So, okay, go ahead. Uh, what's my relationship anyway? I never figured that out. Well, that's why we're here. Okay. <laughs> uh, what would you like to know? Tell us a little about yourself. Uh, you know. How old know? are you? I'm 41 years old. Okay. And you're from? I'm from Long Island. We're in Long Island. Oceanside. Oceanside. Well, some Oceanside is nice. Yeah, it's pretty. And, uh... I like riding my bike. I like jogging. Right. I like watching baseball, and I like listening to Steely Dan records. And when did you start listening to Steely Dan records? Well, I was about 16. 16, so that's that was a, That's about, a little early, uh, isn't it? That, that early. Uh, we don't recommend that anymore, you know? No, and it affects the, uh... Yeah. It affects you, I know, a lot. It's like uh, what they used the, to say about Mad Magazine in the 50s. Yeah, you know? the new guidelines really, um, call for a sort of, uh, a completion or near completion of the maturation process. Mm -hmm. And to have at least a high school diploma as well is, it comes in handy, too, but... I barely got that. So, now, Pete was at one time, uh, and, uh, you may still be mm -hmm. the co, uh, publisher and author of a uh, fanzine, may I call it that? Yes, that's the right name for called it. Called Metal Leg, which is, um, tell us tell us about Metal Leg. Well, it's a, it's a little magazine, about 30 to 40 pages, and it basically uh, follows you guys around. That's right. And, uh, and it's and got metal, articles, and articles it's got pictures, photos, and, and uh, false rumors. All manner of and, uh, <laughs> information in there. And not only that, it also has articles about people that we've worked with, or people right. that we've known, or people right. that... Uh, it's like the minute they work with you guys, they're they're in the metal league. They're in the magazine. Right, we're influential at yes. one time or another, um, yes. and that sort of thing. And uh, in many cases, uh, I've I've read uh, articles in Metal Leg magazine and found out I, I know more about those people than I ever knew before after reading the piece. <laughs> yeah, well, it's probably good for you guys to get to know your players. Now you also have Sometimes another job. happens to me. You have I another know. job. This is really a moonlighting thing. You have another job, right? Yeah, I'm a uh, music booking agent. Yes. And uh, I owe that to you guys for getting me into music. That's why I'm, I'm doing that as a profession and totally influenced by your music. 
That's kind of a shit business, though. I think you'd be sort of <laughs> no, angry at us. No, actually, that. no. I'm very happy with the truth. You have to deal with a lot of sleeves. No, I don't uh, book that many national acts. So I'm okay. Just mm. local bands. Now, when you when let's say you let's say you're you book a band for your club, right? Mm -hmm. And you you've booked five guys or something, and they show up, and there's only four guys, or there's five guys, but not one of the guys that you thought you were booking, right. or there's some other sort of discrepancy, right. uh, um, some sort of. Uh, uh, irregularity right. that uh, you weren't expecting in the uh, gig and which can be traced back directly to the musicians mm -hmm. is that when I mean how do you how do you handle a situation I just take, like I that? just take the money out of their pocket and put it in mine yeah I see. so you, you you get back at them through right. the pocket right. it's my, sort of. right exactly uh -huh. their loss is my game I say now what's this thing down at uh, did you still have that thing going on at La Bar Bat yeah, the that's bar. Where, the bar bat. It's um, on 57th Street. It's the former home of Media Sound Recording Studio, which I don't right, know if you've right. ever recorded there or not. There yes, was a, a church there? Right, it was a church. It was the Manhattan Baptist Church before that. Then it was right. Media Sound, and now it's a nightclub, and that's where I book uh, on the exclusive booking agency. Um, right. And my, the name of my company is called Razor Boy Music because I had to name it after one of your songs because I owe it all to you. And is it well, true you, you book choice. a lot of yes. people who are alumni of our band or who have Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people that have played on your records and that play with you now mm -hmm. will play there often. Mm -hmm. And the minute they, you know, I mean, we have a great time there. It's a great club. And um, among about, those, there's uh, also a band called the Steely Damned. I yeah, the Dynamite. There. Yeah, the Dynamite. Steely Damned from, uh, from San Diego. San Diego. Yeah, they're real good. Yeah, they're pretty mm -hmm. good. Now, what are they like? What are the guys in the Steely Damned like? Are they nice guys? Oh, they're they... very cool. I mean, you know, they're just, just big fans, you know, uh -huh. of the music. And uh, they play it real true to the records, you know, which mm -hmm. I see I think, see when you guys do it, you kind of like to change it up a little bit. Yeah, they, they kinda, do the... They kind of do it just like the records, right? The, Mm -hmm. Now, uh, among these musicians who are alumni of our band, are, are, have you noticed are any of those guys like mad at us? Uh, I better not say. I, there are definitely some people mad at you, but I'm not going to mm -hmm. say anything about that. Well, maybe without well, naming without <laughs> naming the individuals involved. No, because we understand. I, I wouldn't want you to become. Uh, you have to understand what, because no. I understand your situation in this. Right. So without without in any way asking you anything that. Uh, would help, uh, that would identify any of these people. Let's just take uh, musician A who's mad at us. Forget about what instrument he plays. Forget about any identifying characteristics or name or anything like that. Why is he mad at us? Because you stopped using him. Because we stopped using him. Then. Mm -hmm. on, on, on records or Both on concerts? Records and concerts. Because we stopped hiring them all together. That's right. They're now, and, and so what, what is there, how do they interpret that fact? What, just, what do they think about that? We stopped hiring them because... Uh, just because uh, you, you guys messed up, it was just a mistake. It was a mistake. But what does what does person A who is mad at us? Why why does person A imagine what they think we were thinking? Like they probably didn't cut it. Oh, I see. So they're taking it sort of personal. as a personal right. a criticism mm -hmm. right. of, of their uh, of their playing. Right. Pretty much. Mm -hmm.
very much. John Harrington on guitar. All right, now, and person mm -hmm. B who's mad at us, right. another musician, completely different musician right. who's mad at us, right. is angry at us because... Because you don't know what you want. Because we don't know what we want. No. <laughs> That's a very fair criticism, I'd have to say, yeah, wouldn't you, Donald? That's well, what I, at this point, let me ask: of say, say, of say, out of say, say, there were ten musicians that you you book, that that were alumni. Out of the ten, how many of the ten would be mad at us? Uh, probably about three or four of them. Three or four. Yeah, well, under fifty percent. Yeah, I mean, you're doing okay. Not so. It's about thirty-five percent. <laughs>
back to this thing with the, because I think it's sort of interesting, the guys that are men. So here's a band that you've hired, there's say seven or eight guys in the band, right? 35% of them. 35% of least. them. Yeah. Uh, you know, so Upset. three or four guys in a, in a, in a oh, typical yeah. band. But you're sort of is mad at us. You're using they're your coming in And they're coming into the gig now, and now they've got to play all our songs, because that's what well, you've hired when, them for, when, right? When we find the guys that are playing that are mad at you, we try to play your music between the sets to get them even more pissed off. Get them to, to uh, with the right. theory, the theory that, that that will goose them on right. to an even better performance. Right. You see, that's exactly what we that's think. That's what we do. That's yeah. what we think. That's why we they're mad better. at us. That's what it is. You know? See?
Thanks very much, uh, Press the Logic. Things can be really exciting, but you have to work at it to make every day you know, interesting in a way. It's not interesting all by itself all the time. Not for me, anyway. And that's where irony comes in to a certain extent. And it's not that I think anyone really sets out to be ironic. It's a defense, you know, against, against you know, the sort of uh, uh, nature red in tooth and claw, you know? Everything is drinking this car? Yeah, yeah, really. yeah really especially awesome. after that sentence. Whew. Yeah. Any sentence that ends with the word claw <laughs> and then a quotation mark. Is there water or something? Yeah.